So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start this panel now so we can have uh, refreshments and uh, get out of the uh, stuffy room at this point, I think. Yeah, get some fresh air in a little while. Very stuffy. So um, anyway, uh, this is the panel entitled The Knowledge Factories, uh, plural. Uh, Stanley wrote a book called The Knowledge Factory. I think uh, David Van Arsdale has a copy with him there. You can show it. Yeah, that's uh, one, of, one of the additions. And uh, the panel, um, uh, Josh Calbo, who's uh, a member of the uh, board member and also the um, uh, producer of the show Prosperity Marxism, as well as a member of the Institute for Radical uh, Imagination, um, uh, a very long term uh, comrade with us, uh, you know, has been coming to classes and uh, participated very actively. I have watched enormous, uh, in my, my uh, view, enormous intellectual growth, which goes along with, uh, again, tremendous emotional maturity that comes with that intellectual growth uh, going forward. So he's going to begin uh, today. Um, and then Michael Ferlice uh, at the end of the table here is um, um, a professor of sociology at Hudson County Community College in Jersey City. New Jersey. Uh, Michael had Stanley speak out there, as well as Rick Wolf, Fran Piven. Many people came out on his uh, on his watch. Uh, he is also the president of the union there, and probably got, uh, at least from what I understand, one of the best contracts, you know, for for uh, academic labor in the in the United States. Big, big, very, very solid organizer, uh, you know, and uh, and uh, union. Uh, you know, a man, if you will, not boss. Uh, I was going to say boss for a second, but we, we stay away from language like that. And then there's David Van Arsdale, professor also of, of sociology, who's actually doing a writing program now at the City University, at City College, right? Uh, doing uh, some extra work. He's taking a little bit of time off from teaching. Uh, actually, a student going way back in the day, Bill DeFazio, who we also miss and we should mention today. I know he's been mentioned in terms of the jobless uh, uh, future, but uh, you know another dear comrade that passed about it about two years ago. And uh, David's with us today, and uh, he'll be speaking to uh, a lot of things that he went through in his own, not only in his own union, but in education. And then finally, David Winters, who is a graduate student at Rutgers University. I guess he's teaching five classes right now? Five classes. Five classes this semester on top of doing his dissertation. So he's wow. in, uh, he's in uh, a lot of, lot of work mode here. Um, <laughs> another person that studied with Stanley in the Masters of the Liberal Studies program here, which is the part of the co-sponsors. And uh, David, again, started taking classes with us way back in the day at the Brecht. When Stanley did uh, this, the history of the left, and I did the history of materialism, right? Was that that was yeah. the first class I think that we did, and then we had a lot of other ones afterwards. So welcome everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Josh, and I'll okay. I'll let them just speak, and then we'll do a quick roundtable, and then hit the food or whatever the wine more 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 probably. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm Josh Kolba. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to say a little bit, uh, say anything new, basically about. Uh, Stanley, that hasn't been said already. I, I have a lot of things in my paper here that uh, that have already been said, but maybe in a different context. Um, because I knew Stanley primarily as a participant um, for uh, of the Institute for the, for the Radical Imagination. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been part of the collective as well for the uh, uh, journal situations, but uh, mostly as a friend uh, and an, on occasion an interlocutor to many of the people that have spoken today. Um, through the Institute, um, I've been connected to various forms of community and political education for a number of years outside, particularly outside the disheartening problems that confront uh, institutions of higher education outlined by Stanley in his, uh, in his book, The Knowledge Factory, which I'm sure uh, is gonna be you know, most of, the, of what we talk about on this panel. But I wanted to um, uh, you know, sort of talk from this position as a, as a participant of alternative education um, Mostly because, uh, you know, it's it's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, one, the Knowledge Factory was one of the reasons that I, I think I, I pursued alternative education over other forms of higher education. Um, and, you know, I think it gives a different style and a different spin to sort of thinking thinking about education from a different place, basically. So this is what I want to talk to. 
Uh, I met Stanley after the dissolution of the Occupy movement, which uh, uh, initially drew me to, to the Institute. And um, I think, you know, I, like many others, was pretty disheartened by the dissolution of the Occupy movement. Um, but maybe what was one of its greater successes was that I came to the realis realization that despite all the demonstrating and marching and despite all the revolutionary zeal that it conjured, I had a pretty limited theor theoretical background of Marx and political philosophy in general, and a very real uh, sense that the energy I spent demonstrating would ultimately amount to very little without a deep theoretical uh, knowledge and base to operate from in situ uh, within a political community. Um, I had attended a few meetings at the Breck Forum, but it wasn't until I heard Stanley give a few remarks about his experience with some of the Occupy uh, uh, organizing tendencies at a panel at Left Forum, uh, which was also a big part of Stanley's legacy, that I finally felt like I had heard some intuitive truth on the matter. I don't know how or in what way Stanley had reached out to some of the organizers, but in his rendition, they didn't welcome his input. And while this is a sort of understandable position within those moments of rationalization among youthful organizers, what spoke to me was precisely the sense of ahistoricism that Stanley constantly warned against uh, and a kind of insoluble sectarianism among the left, which I felt like at the time was due to a certain level of theoretical poverty, uh, especially on my own part. Um, in one of our earlier seminars, I remember reading from Grand Tree's prison notebooks about class consciousness and spontaneous philosophy and getting a sense that there was finally a place where I could attain, uh, attain the knowledge that I desired from a group, group of people who had also attained this knowledge on their own part, not through coursework towards credentialization per se, or on the other hand, as a cultural cachet for press releases and better sales that I, as I had experienced it through the art world, but because it was part of a political praxis. And in a sense, there was this deep sincerity to the project that I think really took a hold of me. Um, Typically, I would avoid quoting uh, so much in this tradition, I might have to at this point, but by and large, my experience with Stanley and the Institute has been precisely about reading passages together, reflecting on them collectively, and trying to put them into action. So uh, here, it sort of makes sense for me, and, and it, well, at the time while I was writing this, to sort of quote. Um, so, you know, because it, it was a, it, you know, it was a great sort of pleasure that comes from reading with a group, basically, that I think is hard to sort of emulate uh, in a space that's not, uh, it's not oriented towards a, a political praxis in a sense, you know, there's something apart from the Institute. So anyway, I think, you know, the quote that I chose here is from the Gramsci's prison notebooks, and it says, the active man in the mass has a practical activity, but no clear theoretical consciousness is of his practical activity, which nonetheless involves understanding the world insofar as he transforms it. His, his, his theoretical consciousness can indeed be historically in opposition to his activity. One might almost say that he has two theoretical consciousnesses, one or one contradictory consciousness, one which is implicit in his activity and which uh, in reality unites him with his fellow workers in the practical transformation of the real world, and one superficially implicit or verbal, which he has inherited from the past and, uh, and uncritically absorbed. It holds together a uh, specific social group, it influences moral conduct in the direction of the will, but often powerfully enough to produce a situation in which the contradictory state of consciousness does not permit of any action, any decision, or any choice, and produces a condition of moral and political passivity. Critical understandings uh, of self takes place, therefore, through the struggle of political, hegemony, political hegemonies and of opposing directions, first in the ethical field and a higher level of hegemonic force. That is to say, political consciousness is the first stage towards, uh, towards a further progressive self-consciousness in which theory and practice will finally be one. Um, what I liked about this passage, and I think might be relevant for today's discussion, is the sense in which the inherited and the uncritical consciousness in, the conflict, uh, in conflict with the consciousness of practical activity, which produces a condition of inaction and political passivity. Um, this, I think we should return to later, this sort of uh, taxi in a way. In this way, the activity of the Institute was a clarifying first step for me. And now after many years, it has become a kind of intellectual home. As is the case, I'd like to address my comments today towards what Stanley called the arduous task of producing a community of critical scholars who must produce their own space within and without the academic system. What was instilled early on in my experience with the Institute was that education is about uncovering the difficult relation between theory, ideological commitment and political practice. Since my experience with Stanley has primarily been outside the academic system, I thought the better role for me to play here is to address some of what Stanley thought about alternative education, what he called real learning, a culture of praxis, 
in which theory, Marxist and otherwise, is a living theory and part of a lifelong struggle towards greater degrees of freedom. So in preparing my remarks today, I began rereading some of Stanley's work, as well as some of the influences on his ideas about education. And when I was doing this, Michael put me onto a story that Foucault tells in his famous lecture called The Discourse on Language. Um, it has sort of an orient orientalist spin to it, but it kind of fits nicely here as a key to some of the ideas discussed in the Knowledge Factory. So Foucault writes, at the beginning of the 17th century, the Shogun heard tell of a European superiority in, nav in, superiority in navigation, commerce, politics, and the military arts. And that was due to their knowledge of mathematics. He wanted to obtain this precious knowledge. When someone told him of, a, uh, of an in English sailor who possessed this marvelous discourse, he summoned him to his place and kept him there. The Shogun took lessons from the mariner in private and familiarized himself with mathematics, after which he retained power and lived to a very old age. It was not until the 19th century that there were Japanese mathematicians. But that's not the end of the antidote, for it has a, a European aspect as well. The story has it that the English sailor, Will Adams, was a carpenter and an autodidact. Having worked in a shipyard, he had learned geometry. So I think in very eloquent ways, the story encompasses many of the pressing ideas in Stanley's work on education, from the state aims of the development of higher education to the control of and privatizing knowledge into silo disciplines, to its eventual, uh, eventual vocationalization, and finally to its surprise ending and the prominent political position of the autodidact. It is the last of these that I think we should speak more to. Having never formally studied with Stanley in graduate school, I knew Stanley primarily as a radical organic intellectual and the Institute as, uh, for the Radical Imagination is a place to foster this sense of the organic intellectual in many ways after Stanley's own image. To get into this point a bit more, I wanna read a few more lines from the Foucault's introduction because I think it sort of brilliantly attests to a sentiment that has become remarkably true for me in reflecting on Stanley's life and work. So just briefly, Foucault begins, I would really like to have slipped imperceptibly into this lecture, as into all the others I shall be delivering, perhaps over the years ahead. I would have preferred to be enveloped in words born away beyond all possible beginnings. At the moment of speaking, I would have liked to have perceived a nameless voice long preceding me, leaving me merely to enmesh myself in it, taking up its cadence and to lodge myself when no one was looking in its intricacies as if it is passed in an instant, in suspense to beckon me. There would have been no beginnings. Instead, a speech would proceed from me while I stood in its path, a slender gap, the point of its possible disappearance. In reading these lines and thinking about Stanley's influence, it's hard not to hear him uh, precisely as that uh, nameless voice, um, but a personally enduring one for me, and uh, you know, pre long preceding me, and a person who really beckoned all of us to take up a revolutionary cadence. In a sense, I'm speaking here with and through the many important voices I've had the great pleasure of working alongside with at the Institute, uh, which was Stanley, Michael, Peter, Bruno, Arto, and many other of the comrades over the seminars of the, of, over the years. My place in the Institute is somewhat accidental, and I speak here through a spirit, camaraderie, and dedication to the constant engagement with ideas and revolutionary thought that has come from the culture the Institute has fostered, and which for me cannot be undone. I bring all of this up because I think it speaks to a crucial distinction between real learning and schooling embodied by Stanley and the Institute that real learning and the production of knowledge takes place collectively and dialogically through the many varied and fragmentary interactions in a polemic. All to say, I think the necessary precondition for an alternative uh, or revolutionary pedagogy begins by fostering an atmosphere that encourages the intellectual development of people from all walks of life to take up a critical disposition to the world and to become the autodidact that Foucault writes about and that Stanley was. And in, in a sense, you know, in my company, Stanley was always very proud of this point. He used to tell a story about he had, how he'd been invited to speak on Amy Goodman's show, Democracy Now. At some point, he told a story about how he got his degree on air, which apparently surprised her, and was the reason for which Stanley thought he was never invited back. <laughs> True or not, I'm not sure, but I think that Stanley was always proud of never, uh, of, of being this autodidact, precisely because he had great pride in his working class background and was to a degree the pride of the working class. And I think this is something that has been relatively forgotten these days for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we spoke a lot about them already, but, uh, but also, you know, in one way due to social media, due to, to whatever, but to also precisely because of the inculcation of bourgeois values through higher education as a result of its commonplace status. And this is not to romanticize the working class either. And we talked to this all day, actually, Stanley had a you know, lots of things to say about that. But um, 
I think, you know, the point is that there's a certain approach to education and even a kind of engagement of all the great works we've read together that really grounded, uh, that was really grounded from a class consciousness and from this working class position. And when we read Hegel or the Frankfurt School or Marx, we, uh, we did so not only because it uh, contained much of value, but precisely because the knowledge provided the basis uh, for, uh, for a critique and transvaluation of the canon. And here Stanley was really elegant in his book. He says, the basic question is not whether to read the ruminations of a series of dead white men, but what the point of the surge, sojourn might be. Of course, there's no way to avoid cultural capital accumulation. The task of pedagogy is to encourage the surplus, the elements of the canons that transcend the sacred text by putting them in their historical context and into the debates that form them. And this was also the basic but extremely crucial point for me, having read Sartre as an undergraduate, for example, exclusively as, a, as an existentialist and without the full context of his truly extraordinary revolutionary life. A text that Stanley was never presented without situating historically, which we have tested to all day, and sometimes a little too well uh, about a story about the oil, chemical, and atomic workers union. He used to go on about that forever. But it was never presented without its economic, political, and, and social history, uh, as is so typically the case in the core curriculum of the university. Uh, but what I think, um, but I think beyond all this so far, what really gained from um, what it was really gained from this was his style. And style has become an idea that has become more important to me uh, politically than I once saw. Um, and I think it's one of the more essential characteristics for an alternative education is a kind of reading of text that was serious, that was also uh, that also never left left out what White had described as the romance of reading. Uh, to my mind, it might be better characterized what Bachelard calls concerned reading. Bachelard uses terms as a way of describing his phenomenological reading of poetry, but in a similar way, I like uh, what the term connotes politically because it situates all the reading we do together within its political stakes. It's not merely an exercise in critical reading within academic discourses, but instead reiterates that these works are connected in fundamental ways to revolutionary praxis and that it's necessary to understand them in their complexity and precision precisely because these works challenged and changed our fundamental categories of understanding, which is perhaps the most radical act possible. It is this change in tonality and intentionality that I think generally gave um, a different shape to education uh, that was to Stanley real learning and what makes it uh, possible to develop critical intellectuals towards um, the full development of the human being, uh, which is a, a nice definition of communism. Uh, which in my view is far more possible from this uh, alternative education position, this radical education, uh, than from the, you know, the confines and the hypocrisy of the bourgeois liberalism. So I think he, Stanley had another line um, as well. Ironically, the best preparation for the worker of the future might be to cultivate knowledge of the broadest possible kind, to make learning a way of life that in the first place is pleasurable and then rigorously critical. For it is when, uh, only when the learner loves uh, literature, enjoys puzzling out the meaning of our works and those of philosophy, is intrigued by social and cultural theory, or becomes an unrelenting researcher, that she acquires intellectual habits that are the precondition for fur further learning. A learner who is really understands the economy knows how fragile the concept of career is. And I think seen in this way, Stanley's somewhat defense of the great books against the vocational claims of their uselessness makes more sense. None of it's useless to the revolutionary mind or for its own sake, but rather explicates the stresses, ruptures, and changes in the categories of understanding necessary for our world to win. It is an open question for me today, however, with the displacement of the university as the once radical center for the production of the general culture, whether the university can remain the active source of the production of radical theory and politics or be the site of revolutionary inculcation. My fear is that what's alive in these theories at this point becomes reduced to classroom subject matter uh, exclusively, and in a sense, its domain professionalized and consequently negated. With a shift towards vocationalization and subsequently the reduced ability to freely determine curriculum, as well as the tacit encroachment on academic freedom by tenure, as well as the precarity of adjunct professors, not to mention the financialization and the lifetime of indigenous for its students, it's almost impossible to see the hard-fought freedoms of the university that once existed for a generation of radical thinkers existing in a way that could yield time and space for this kind of work for all but a few academic stars. Stanley raised this provocative question in the book as well, albeit in a slightly different way. It might be possible to show that the virtual abandonment by today's educational leaders of the goals of providing for society a layer of critical intellectuals is a response to the upsurge of student activism in the 1960s. 
In this light, the turn towards vocationalization and towards a reduced conception of learning might, uh, may be part of an effort openly urged by many on the right to make sure the 1960s never happened again. And if by judging by the relative lack of the student movements or the, in recent history as real sites of resistance is any measure, they have been relatively successful. However, I'm far from suggesting that we should give up on the university as a necessary site of revolutionary struggle. Still, it's captured by business or other bourgeois interests has achieved an ideological uh, hegemony, as Gramsci would say, creating a common sense where the university appears independent from economic and state relations to most people. If the purpose of real education is to encourage the emergence of a specific kind of discourse, which presupposes the project for the formation of subjectivities that is increasingly separate from the structure, is the university still capable of being the site of the project? I think my question here ultimately lies within a sort of uh, Marxian Gramsci framework again, which is not, uh, which, which is whether or not the university can ever answer, answer Gramsci's great question about equality affirmatively. Is the intention that there should always be rulers and ruled, or is the objective to create the conditions in which this division is no longer necessary? And while I gravitate towards alternative schools like Stanley C.P. Jefferson High School Social Sciences, or his work with the Free University of New York, the non-degree granting, non-credit school situated on a loft in 14th Street, and its later successors, the Free U and the Alternative U or the Open University, these programs were developed and supported by communist political parties and left alliances that had cultural connections to the new left, among others. This, by and large, does not exist today. So I think an equally concerning question might be, can there be revolutionary pedagogy in a non-revolutionary society? Um, I don't have a clear answer to these questions by any means, but I do want to pick them on a brief passage in Stanley's other book on education called Against Schooling. Uh, where he makes some remarks and gives an interesting critique of pa Paolo Freire's uh, pedagogy of the press in the form of uh, additional theoretical questions about education that I think may often go unaddressed, mainly because they make already hard problems harder to solve. In a way, I bring it up here because I think uh, it's what I found to be remarkably, uh, Stanley to be remarkably good at, abstracting social, psychological, and political philosophy from, uh, from a specific social context to reveal its intellectual content. In this case, I think it's interesting to bring up Stanley's somewhat tacit critique of post-structuralism's displacement of questions concerning class, gender, and race to subject, subject positions determined by discursive formations, or in somewhat more straightforward language, the post-structuralist confrontation with subjective agency. It's really a remarkable section of the book because it traces a path to which, uh, to which, the, to which to theoretically think radical education, and it also situates it within a revolutionary praxis, which avoids attaching education to a fundamentally humanistic framework, of which I admit I'm uh, mostly uh, I mostly intuitively gravitate towards, but nonetheless, he is an extremely interesting and pro productive limit. What's particularly interesting from this section for our discussion here is, with St is Stanley's enthusiasm to introduce the psychoanalytic dimension to thinking about uh, radical pedagogy, precisely because questions of education are so inextricably linked to questions about agency. If we posit the necessity of the oppressed to take charge of their own liberation, including the revolutionary process, which in the first place is educational, how can we confront not only the externally imposed material oppression, but the domination that the opposed interdict themselves at the psychological level? To this point, Fromm's, Fromm's fear of freedom was a reference point to Stanley, and I think an interesting way to think about what has happened to the ambitions of students towards higher education, but also what has become the aims of education itself. Stanley writes, this interjection takes uh, the form of fear by members of the oppressed classes that learning in the praxis to which it is uh, ineluctably linked will alter life's, their life situation. The implication is that the oppressed have an investment in their uh, oppression because it represents the already known, however grim the conditions of everyday existence. In fact, Freire's pedagogy seems crucially directed to breaking the cycle of psych psychological oppression by engaging students in confronting their own lives, that is to engage in dialogue with their own fear uh, as the repre uh, representation within themselves of the power of the oppressor. Freire's pedagogy is directed then to the project of assisting the, the oppressed not only to overcome material opposition, but also attain the freedom from the sadomasochism that these relationships embody. For Freire, profits and accumulation may account for exploitation of labor, but are insufficient explanations in the face of brutal domination. The dominating elites have a collective sadistic character corresponding to the masochism of the dominated. This is interesting in today's context, and as much as we've seen a certain expression of this foregrounded in particular, uh, particularly around issues of race and decolonialism, 
in mostly positive ways. Still, it's important to see that the implications of this psychological dichotomy extend universally to all facets, facets of everyday life. Of course, this is a complex issue that is somewhat apart from our discussion, but I wanted to draw it out briefly because I think it presents questions about the limits of the traditional structure and form of education on the one hand, and on the other speaks towards a new problematic of the subject, gives a more open-ended uh, revolutionary futurity to education, one which is directed towards new forms of social practice and collective liberation, rather than personal liberation, one in which the full development of the human being means to shed the image in which dominant elites, including leftist intellectuals, can be self-directed, and one that posits a dialogic, a di the dialogic as a central category for education and the fundamental condition for human emancipation. And this is, of course, uh, to a degree, the framework and logic of the Institute for the Rag Radical Imagination, a proposition to learn geometry from the shipyard. So thank you, Michael. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And uh, uh, I appreciate being able to speak here today in, in honor of Stanley and of uh, the uh, long-lasting contributions he's made. Um, you know, I always thought of Stanley almost as like an octopus. He had tentacles everywhere. It was amazing to me. And I, I related to him in a way that, I mean, I was my own working class background. Uh, and I know like when I first met Stanley, who I, I thought was, you know, a very uh, powerful and profound intellectual, uh, there was no pretense there at all whatsoever. Uh, he was so warm, welcoming, and kind of, even though you weren't his equal, he always spoke to you as if he was your equal, which re really kind of uh, amazed me. Um, so my introductory statements will be a little brief here, because I think we're going to be exchanging uh, discussions and stuff. So, um, so I run a, a union at Hudson County Community College. I think maybe one of the reasons I was asked to speak here today, not, not on theoretical grounds per se, but for the fact that I made a decision to um, basically uh, build my union so it's what I would think a union should be or the best it could be. Uh, and uh, that meant starting with a union that was really just a union in name. It, there, it had no reality to it. Um, we had a president who would walk or had presidents who would walk around. Um, I think the thing that made them feel best is when the president of the college invited them over for dinner at his house. Um, and uh, we got very, very little things either in contract or in any way uh, that you'd want a union to be there uh, to stop the college from doing certain things or before certain things. Anyway, um, you know, I, I watched that for a while. I think I was pretty cynical about American labor. I agree with most things that have been said here about the problem with unions and labor. However, the problem is when you're at a college and you have a union and you are not involved, it, it's even worse because you're watching this theater of, of, of the absurd. You're identifying things that can be done to prevent some awful things that are taking place and taking apart the curriculum, you know, uh, treating fac faculty like factory workers and this whole factory thing really sort of going full steam ahead. And at some point, I just thought, I'm going to dive in here. Um, I've studied with Stanley. I've studied with others. Uh, let me see if some of these ideas can actually work, you know, uh, and that's really what I felt. I mean, it was a, a sort of application of theory. Uh, and I think that's also how he related to Stanley, that I was always impressed with the fact that Stanley, as theoretical as he was, and I, I understand what Yvonne and others were saying about his, you know, privileging maybe of theory, um, it was never ever sort of removed from practice or engagement or experiment, you know, and I think many ways, uh, I think of my own work with this union as an experiment. Um, and I think, the, the possibility of building a union that can do the things that maybe unions or we aspired them to do is part of the experiment and the challenge. Uh, so, um, you know, we kicked out our former president, our union president. Uh, we took over the union uh, and uh, we put together a leadership group that were really tough, really strong. And we had an awful college president, super Machiavellian, and he knew how to control the union. He knew how to control the faculty. He controlled the trustees. And we were just really ready to fight. I mean, we were, our, our message was, we're gonna go in there and just fight 
to the death, you know. And I, I think uh, between that time, uh, that was in May 2018 or 18. And then um, by September, he resigned, he quit. And we got a new president. And there was this confluence of things that happened there. I mean, talk about contingency and chance, right? Um, we get this president, he's kind of liberal minded. We wanted to make sure that when he came into our college, he didn't see a union that was just sort of gutted and, you know, we're all over the place and what we're talking about, but that we're militant, we're organized, and we're ready to kill, you know? I mean, we're, we're really ready to fight and go all the way. And we were pretty rough on him when we first met him, right? Uh, I was thinking it's sort of like, you know, the image of a cat, you know, when it's facing an opponent, it turns sideways so it looks bigger than it is. I mean, we weren't really a very strong or powerful union, but we knew that he was going to have to see us in that sense. And that's how we presented ourselves. And it kind of established the entire framework by which we would have a relationship with him to this day. And established a framework in which the other unions at our college, which are quite weak, uh, have gotten much better deals because in order for him to sort of deal with them, he has to deal with us. We set the pace. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think as we talk here, I was hearing some of the things Josh was saying about education. I think it's relevant to the union work also. I mean, if you want to think about how awful curriculum can get, just think about having a college or university with a union that is asleep at the wheel and doesn't prevent the college from, you know, automating the classroom, right? Or uh, using AI to sort of just replace any sort of, you know, real critical engagement. And uh, I can talk about it as we go on, but I mean, we did many, many things to sort of change that entire dynamic. Now, it's not like we're there, hey, you know, I mean, it's an endless battle, it's exhausting, and there's a lot of sacrifice, but I don't think it's impossible. And I, I guess that's the issue I was sort of taking a little bit when I was hearing some of the other panelists. Uh, I Theoretically, I don't disagree, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that unions can't be a powerful force. And in fact, I mean, look, union, unions have money. I mean, unions have a lot of money. They got lawyers. Um, we should not cast unions aside and say that history is over. I mean, I think I was there at that one point. And when I started studying with Stanley, I was taken by the fact that theory, labor, politics, you know, uh, philosophy were sort of all work, working uh, through his thought there in a, in a very important way. So, um, you know, I think we need to reconsider labor. I think Stanley would have always, you know, taken this position. And where are those interventions? I absolutely agree. Part of the problem of unions is we don't have any educational sort of dimension to us, right? That's a problem because that means that we don't, we're, we're bereft of ideas. And, you know, I mean, because of my background, I've been able to inject some of those maybe more radical ideas in our union, but there ain't that many people doing it. Unions can educate their members, and they do. That's a lesson I've learned in my union. We educate our members. We radicalize our members. And part of what the administration did was it tried to steal our members and make them administrators. And at first, I was resisting it. And then I realized, holy crap, what's better than having a radicalized, labor-oriented uh, faculty in the administration? And that is what we're, we're, we're starting to have there, right? So... Um, yeah, I, I guess personally, I feel that in my own experience, um, we, we should not just dismiss unions. We have to think about how they can be re-radicalized. Where is the point of intervention? Uh, we're bereft of ideas. We need radical ideas. And uh, I just wanted to, again, we can talk about it a little more in a second, but uh, one of the things I do want to address is the issue of contract. Because I can tell you this right now, if I was not able to negotiate a really good contract for my members, and I was never economic, I'm not, you know, uh, what we call uh, the, the problem of economism, right? I didn't go into my union with really economic priorities. My priority was about culture, about, you know, reorienting us and all this stuff, uh, radicalizing us. But um, I have to tell you, if I could not negotiate a really good contract, if I could not bring the goods into my members, they could give a shit less about my ideas, okay? Our first contract, we negotiated 
just a lot of things, but just financially. I'm, I'm not talking about the other things that I think are really important, but we negotiated anywhere from a 13 to 29, almost 30% increase in salaries for the first year. And then each year after that, 4% increase compounded on top of that, plus retroactive pay. Okay. Un absolutely unheard of. All right. Now, a lot of people who didn't associate with me because they thought I was radical or, they, you know, a lot of members at the time said, be careful getting involved. All of a sudden, they want to start meeting with me and talking with me. All of a sudden, I'm able to put together maybe eight committees, different committees, culture committee, right? faculty student relations committee. We have an education committee. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of committees and they're real committees. They really do things. But you can't do that unless you can bring in the goods. You know, I mean, that's just a fundamental fact of it. If you limit yourself to that, then we're in the situation, I think that Peter raised very, you know, uh, legitimately, you know, then you're just kind of status quo, lower middle class, complacent and kind of going to sleep. But I guess the question, I'll leave it at this, I guess the question on my mind, and I, I'd like to make that the question for all of us is, in a dialectical way, can unions go beyond themselves? You know, I mean, if we're not just there, uh, you know, at this little college negotiating a couple more shekels for everybody or whatever, and maybe privileging the full time over the part time, you know, we're, we're living off their skin and stuff. I mean, you know, can we form alliances with intellectuals, with the community, with activist groups? Uh, can we inject some sort of, um, you know, uh, radical imagination? And that imagination, by the way, is also our, our faculty seeing boundaries. I, I have young faculty, and I don't think they actually have the same imagination as, as many of the people in this room have. I see a boundary between the administration and the faculty. I see a boundary between my room and what my dean is. I don't think a lot of my faculty have that. It doesn't mean they can't have it. But that's what I'm saying. I think we, we need to change that dynamic that the unions are there, they failed, Let's, where are we going to move on, right? Uh, we have to, I think, think about sort of re, reinvigorating them, reintellectualizing them, and uh, hopefully getting them to move beyond themselves or beyond what they are uh, currently. Thanks. Right. Uh, it's going to be hard to go for such optimism to such pessimism. Pessimism of the intellect, optimist of the will. But, um, you know, I think we, you know, we met before uh, this panel this time, this time, and we talked about some roles that we would play. And one of the things I really wanted to try to bring to this panel was uh, a bit of, uh, of, of the sort of movements that are happening in education at the, um, at the student level, uh, which I'll get to. But my sort of segue into that is, as many of us have done, I think, is to start with a little bit of story about Stanley and our relationship to Stanley, which I think is right for this sort of conference. I, I'm bet I'm not the only one that's received career advice from Stanley, <laughs> any, anybody else in here. Um, and in 2007, I was at the Murphy Institute uh, and a distinguished lectureship position that Stanley helped, uh, helped me secure. And in that spring about this time in 2007, I, um, I you know, I, we were going to have dinner together. And I said, you know, the presumption was we were going to talk about this research I was doing on employment agencies in Jackson Heights. This is when he lived in Jackson Heights. So I took the seven train out there after work one day. And, you know, what I, what I was really going there to talk to him about was I was telling him that I was leaving my job at uh, the Murphy Institute because I had some family issues I needed to take care of. And they were back up in Syracuse where I'm, where I was raised. And I, you know, I had already accepted a job teaching at the community college there at Syracuse. And so I was, you know, telling him that. And I knew he was going to be upset. You know, I mean, I'd only been at the Murphy Institute for about a year. And, um, you know, again, he helped me get that job. Um, but, you know, he was, you know, he, he understood. He understood why. Uh, but he was mostly concerned, you know, and, and he was, this is, course, you know, after the knowledge factory is out, and his big concern was, and everybody here can relate to this, but uh, that the corporatization of public education was particularly impacting places like community colleges and uh, in, in four-year colleges. And he was really concerned that, you know, teaching a, a five-course load, which by, by the way is standard, you know, at, at community colleges, 
for a semester with uh, you know 150 students a semester. And um, the, this sort of like labor demand would infringe upon and the intellectual work, which as we all know is vital to the role of, is vital to the role of faculty, but something that Stanley really believed in. And so um, anyway, I had to do what I had to do, but he, you know, he, he cautioned against it. <laughs> when I started, when I went there, so I wanna give some sort of student perspective and sort of wrap some issues around class, class reproduction that the knowledge factory deals with in my talk. When I started there, uh, it was a real time of boom at community colleges. And uh, we had record enrollments, 14,000 students at, uh, at you know, Syracuse's community college. It's called Onondaga Community College. So we had 14,000 students when I started there. We had 44 sections per semester of sociology. I was going to teach in sociology. So, you know, 100 with summer courses, 100, a little over 100 courses a year. And, you know, just, the, uh, just to give you a sense of where we are today, we have 14 classes a semester in sociology right now. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've had just, just wide scale reduction in um, full time faculty. And um, we, we, it, the transition to uh, a different kind of education since I've been there, uh, you know, what some of the, the things that Stanley talks about. Uh, and it's just, it's, been, it's just been so vivid. So just, I just want to like tease out some of the major trends that have been moving students out of the humanities and social sciences. And then we can sort of, you know, talk about if they're good or not. But uh, I, I thought I'd start with this uh, little story, which is that, again, the, when I started there, uh, we, the college was doing very well. I had lots of extra money, decided to invest in these new marble you know, entrances uh, <laughs> with the co you know college name uh, at each entrance. Two entrances, big marble statues. Theatrical well, music. Yeah, playing. welcome to OCC. Actually, they're digital, so there's like, you know, there's it, yeah, they're multimedia almost, right? But you know, the inscribed at the bottom of uh, you know Onondaga Community College was explore, discover, and transform. Uh, and um, you know, I kind of like that, right? Just explore, discover, and transform. Today's administration does not like this at all. Like they can't wait to fill that in with cement and replace <laughs> it with something else. And um, you know, I think I think you know if they had to choose their model today, it'd be something like a short path to a job. And so I just I just so just just touching on a, 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 the sort of reordering of educational values in the last sixteen years. I can't believe it's been sixteen years since that dinner conversation with Stanley, but it has been. Um, okay, I'm gonna, just because of time, I'm going to skip a section here. So um, I hadn't read the Knowledge Factory, you know, when we had that conversation. Uh, but a couple of years into my teaching, and I've now been uh, president at our local, Michael and I have talked about this, you know, a little bit. And um, I'm, I'm part of the grievance committee uh, since I've been there. I've been very involved in the union. I can talk about that stuff, but I really want to talk about how it's changed for students. So first point, uh, as Stanley and, and, um, and William DeFazio point out in the jo jobless future, you know, good jobs ain't so good anymore. This, you know, and um, the shift to flexible and service work uh, came not just, you know, with a shift, but also with a shift in the dominant state ideology, uh, regardless of whether it was led by Republicans or Democrats, they continued to press the narrative that work would save us you know, save us from, you know, the, the, the poverty of the 2006 recession. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that's never gone away. And, it, you know, this hasn't been mentioned here today, but, you know, the Obama administra administration really stressed STEM, you know, and STEM education. And if you were going to have a future, it was going to be in STEM fields. And, you know, that mantra has been out there, right? Uh, so uh, that ideology has certainly trickled down to students. They're well aware of this. Um, it, it, you know, th they come in with a sense that, uh, you know, if they study management or if they study computer science or this sort of thing, then, um, you know, they're going to have some, some money for their family and et cetera. So, okay. So, so, so there's, that, there's that shift, that ideological shift in the dogma of work. 
from sort of the industrial to now the uh, sort of tech stem shift, right? Okay, so then there's this um, uh, other factor. The second point I want to make is, which Stanley gets into, and I'm going to add to a little bit. There's a, also a multi-pronged funding crisis. The National Endowment of the Humanities, just as an example of part of the crisis, has lost since, 80, since 1979, 1980, 60% of its funding, right? So it used to have about 155 million at its peak per year grants to disseminate in the humanities, and today they got about 70 billion. It, you know, if you want to just quickly compare that to NSF funding, National Science Foundation funding, mostly going to STEM fields, you know, you're talking about a massive increase um, at, that today peaks out at about 70 billion a year. So big, huge discrepancy there, right? Second point around a multi, you know, what, what's multi-pronged here in terms of a funding crisis. All state institutions, tuition, in all state institutions, so tuition support has radically changed, but declined um, in major ways. And if you, if you just think about the project at the community college for a second, it start, they started off as free institutions, late 50s, uh, through the early 70s, these institutions were agreements between uh, county, uh, you know, the counties and the uh, uh, states that, you know, how, uh, housed the counties, right? And usually the counties would pay a percentage, usually up to, you know, 40, 50 percent, and the state would pick up the rest of the tab. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the community college that, that I teach at now, my, my mother went there uh, and received a training program that led to a job that she had for 35 years, but she never paid a, a penny for that program. That was a credential program. And, uh, you know, that, that's how these, these today, however, uh, that's not the case. Uh, these institutions are mostly tuition funded institutions. They're totally dependent on student tuition that completely changes how you recruit and do all sorts of other things. Right. But uh, today uh, in New York, most of the community colleges get about 18, 19% from the state. They get about 18, 19, maybe 20% from their county. And the student tuition picks up the rest of the bill. All Same right. In New Jersey. Same in New Jersey. So, you know, that, that, that puts a lot more pressure on, on students to sort of carry the weight of things. And that changes a lot of things. But anyway, okay. So, so um, uh, just, to, to amend one of uh, uh, Stanley's findings here in the book, financial aid, he, you know, he just, this book comes before this change. The structure of financial aid for students has radically shifted. And this is something that is, is very much tied to the sort of ideology of STEM. Uh, today at most community colleges, that, you know, well, in, in all state education, doesn't matter, two or four year, you have to stay within a program in order to get funding. You're only allowed to take a couple of courses outside of a program. Otherwise, the state's not gonna cover, financial aid's not gonna cover, when I say state, in this case, I'm talking about the federal state, it's not gonna cover that tuition. So the, the, the model, why does, why does the college wanna change the model, you know, explore? Uh, <laughs> because you can't explore. You know, you have to get a degree program and you have to stay in that program. Otherwise, you're just not gonna get money. There are also other penalties that this is all under the Obama administration, by the way, you have to finish a, a four-year degree within five years. And, you know, if, if you don't finish a class, you have to retake that class if it's within a program before they reinstate. Uh, you know, so it's, 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 become, it's become very strict, very paternal. And, um, you know, this, this really has influenced the, the reduction of the kinds of jobs or the kinds of programs that students go into because, you know, they, they know they're going to have debt. Now it, it's a question of like, you know, you know, what do I choose to handle that debt, right? Which is something that, that Stanley talks about in the knowledge factory. The, the, the idea of being able to explore because you want to. No, I, I think there's a really great reason, Josh, right? Yeah. To, 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 to keep doing the community thing. Lastly, it's not cheap. Um, and it's become more expensive. There's been fairly big increases on on students and tuition, you know, it's, it, it, I don't know if this sounds like a lot of money to you or not, but if you're a local student and you commute to go full-time, it's going to cost you about $6,000. That's similar, probably. Yep. You know, $6,000 is, is if you commute. These days, most community colleges have dorms and how they're really trying to sustain their, uh, 
their budgets is through dorms because you pay $10,000 a year minimum to stay in a dorm. Now it's the middle-class kids, and here's where we get into a lot of the reproduction of class. It's a lot of the middle-class kids that end up staying in the dorms because they want the whole you know, college experience, right? And they, some of the sports programs and whatnot. But the poor kids in, you know, where I am, you know, half of our students are immigrants and refugees. We're, Syracuse is a federal refugee resettlement city. So we have really large scale populations of, uh, of refugees and they've sort of saved the city. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that uh, those students are li likely commuting, the refugee students and the city students and the poor rural students will commute because they don't wanna take on that extra debt. The risk to that is though, to commute, they have to have a job, they usually take care of families. And so their retention rate between the first and third semester is, is half that of the students who live on campus. So if you live on campus, you're twice as likely to make it to your third semester from the first semester. So it's that that's, you know, Again, this sort of reproduction of class factor here is alive and well, and there's no better place to view it in a sad way, obviously, than uh, at the community college. Uh, the third point I want to make is just about rising paternalism. And this is where, you know, I, it really, it's not, it, it, it's not just about it affecting faculty, although that it does affect faculty, it's also about how that affects students. Um, you know, there's a book written uh, in the 70s called The Right to Manage by uh, John Howell, he's an industrial human rights sort of guy, but it's really become the mantra for a lot of how to run uh, educational institutions in the last 30 years. The basic idea is, you know, that we should run these institutions like businesses, and we shouldn't let unions have power, and we should do everything to break that power. And you know, they're really taking lessons right now from the Amazons and Starbucks and about in terms of breaking faculty power and whatnot. Uh, and in, in many ways they're winning. And, you know, you think, well, how does this hurt students? Uh, it hurts them in all kinds of ways. I mean, the, the, the shift, so we're in a situation where the college is sort of redefining the meaning of retrenchment uh, in our union. Uh, and they're, they're just using it as a, you know, they're calling it retrenchment, but it, it's, they're just laying faculty off, junior faculty off. Right? I mean, that's what they're doing. And but because because in the union, you know, most most contracts have a retrenchment policy. It's almost always linked to economic hardship and restructuring. But it's not, it's not those things. <laughs> they're saying it's those things, but it's not. Anyways, here's the thing: like they they have on their payroll the largest union busting law firm in Central New York. You know, and we've gone broke. Our union has gone broke fighting them. You say you have a lot. Of, I mean, we we're we're broke. We we have fought several big cases, and we've won several big cases. But that doesn't put money back in the, you know, in the bank account. Anyway, you pay for that out of your local union dues. Depends on if nice it takes it on or not. Are they taking it on? Some cases they've taken it. Some and the ones that they've taken on have really been about sort of civil issues and and they've been expensive but sorry Mr. no but it, it's it's a uh, it, it's a good question Any, anyway um yeah not, it's not that nice it doesn't help it's it's that um yeah it, it's just that we can't fight we, we don't have the fun, funds at the local level to to fight the way we need to and nice it doesn't seem interested in taking on this retrenchment issue at this point maybe they'll change their minds last point i want to make is that um, oh yeah, I, I just wanted to say quickly that how does that you know how does that how does that affect students? I mean, you know, you you can imagine the the, the disorganization and the fear factors that fac faculty have right now. There's you know they're stepping on eggshells, and it, it, it's just really changed the whole atmosphere of the learning environment. Uh, last point: administrators at the local level are redefining everywhere the dominant state ideology I mentioned earlier that management matters more than community. Personal investment matters more than community investment. STEM education is superior to the social sciences and humanities. They, and and what, I, what I'm trying to focus here is that they do this at the local scale so well. I mean, I'm, you know, if you went to our website, like, you know, there's two categories, direct career to work category, transfer category. 
you, no matter which one you, you choose, right? You, you see the majors and you click on it and then they, they give you a number of your average salary after you finish the degree. It's just like, they're just like dangling, you know, the gold in front of students. And, you know, and, and you know, this is the kind of, I kept saying, this is the sort of thing that students are interested in though too, right? Like when they show up and you sort of say to them, they, they wanna know, well, how much am I gonna make if I do this? But I also want to say that the data is totally wrong anyway. Even 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 you know the fact that it's you know a sort of wrong to I think pimp students' aspirations that way with gold and their and whatnot. Uh, it, it's also just like you know nobody can figure out where the heck they got the data from. It certainly it's, cer it's certainly like it certainly privileges the uh, shocking the the STEM stuff. All right, so money, money, money. Um, some of you uh, may have seen an article that came out in the New Yorker this week that, um, that, that was titled The End of the English Major. Definitely worth a read. Um, 30 years well after the last. Well, I mean, it's, it echoes, so, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I, I, I mean I've, got, I've, got some, I've got some critiques of it, but it's not just about the English major, it's about the humanities. It, it, you know, where I am, it's not behind the times. We, humanities, social science was the largest major when I went there in 2007, it was the largest. You know, that's the, it, it, today we're like nothing, you know, and, um, and I think that that, you know, if, if you look at the data, even if the theory in it is 30 years behind the times, if you look at the data there, um, it, it seems really, you know, just, you know, it, it, it's just worth focusing on. I think these changes in sort of the, the financialization, the, the, the way that students pay for school and how we fund these programs and the ideology issues, I mean, all of that stuff, which Stanley does a wonderful job in articulating, uh, set up the shift. And um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> to move that there. I tend to speak very loudly, so I get like a little bit afraid of microphones around me. Um, okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for being here all day for folks who have been here all day. Um, this is the last panel, I'm the last one to go, so I'm going to keep this snappy and I'm gonna get my energy up for it and everybody's gonna have a great time and then we'll be out of here. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about uh, my experience of Stanley and uh, uh, how I, um, uh, uh, experience the singularity of Aronowitz and, and the way that I'm thinking about that and how I've carried that into um, uh, whatever the hell it is I'm doing for work right now. I wouldn't really call it a career, but like working on a dissertation and, and scrambling to, to put together enough adjuncting jobs to, to make a living. Um, so here's where I'll start. Um, Michael uh, in Michael Pelius in a, an email exchange about this panel suggested that one of the things that I can bring to the panel, uh, I think he said, uh, thinking otherwise. And I've thought a little bit about the difference between otherwise thinking and thinking otherwise. Um, but if I have a, a, a chance to think otherwise within this room uh, about Stanley's work, it's because I, I came from so far, so far outside of this room. Um, and the path that I took into this room was, uh, was cleared by Stanley without um, me knowing uh, at the first stages, and then uh, with my full knowledge at the, the sort of middle stages. Um, though I'm sure he would be sad that I've dedicated myself to adjuncting at this point. Um, just for me, he would be sad. For the quality of my life, he'd be sad. Um, but I walked into the Grad Center um, uh, as a result of um, the MA in Liberal Studies program, which Stanley was um, key in forming in the first place. Um, and that happened because I had absolutely no idea what the hell uh, I was doing or how to navigate uh, academia. I grew up in a, a very conservative, anti-intellectual house, Nixon and Reagan Republican kind of house. Um, my great uncle was uh, was one of Nixon's um, primary fundraisers and one of his best friends. He invented aerosol, he invented this aerosol spray valve. My father was a cop, Marine. My mother was a nurse, anti-labor nurse, you know. Um, so like, <laughs> Uh, the kinds of pop culture that we watched, you know, the, the the stuff that we took in was John Wayne and like stuff that you didn't have to think about. My father hated stuff that made him think, you know, like we weren't allowed to engage with stuff that made my father have thoughts that was that was bad stuff. Um, 
but for whatever reason, my family had uh, uh, a thing about sending me to a very good college, though they were anti-intellectual. So um, I found myself at Lafayette College um, in an English program at a very nice school where you had very small classes and we got to talk about some stuff um, at length. And that was neat. But um, the question was for my family and for myself, how, how does this turn into a career? Right? Obviously, this is the only thing that we think about. This is true in the late 90s. It's even more true now. Um, and the answer was, who the hell knows? So I got out of uh, college and, and got a bunch of sales jobs and went from sales jobs, basic sales jobs, construction jobs first, manual labor, and then sales jobs, really sales jobs, direct sales jobs. Like, um, And then I started selling bonds, like at a bond brokerage firm. And then I got into marketing. And then from marketing, I got into advertising. Advertising, I got some training into strategic communication. And as a um, account planner, somebody who does brand strategy, your job uh, is to see the entire, um, the audience and the client and all the creative work being done around a campaign in totality, right? So my first entrance into like being encouraged to think in totalities was actually on the corporate side when I was working for like E-Trade and Scott Trade and the United States Marine Corps and Burger King and, and really terrible brands. Um, uh, but they they taught me that like I had a right and the most effective kind of thinking was to think totally, right? Take in everything that you possibly could. And there was a certain kind of like aggression and ambition within these positions where we were expected to think a little bit more than the strategists before us and bring in insights that CEOs and clients couldn't understand, but would not go, oh, that sounds, that sounds like, that sounds really good. So by the time I got sick of working for, for the Marine Corps and Burger King, um, I decided that I was going to go to grad school, though I had no idea what grad school was about or how it would result in me eventually teaching, which I kind of knew I wanted to do, and specifically at the college level, because who wants to teach high school? It's so hard. Who wants to teach lower grades? Like, it's so hard. The routine is so difficult, right? This is my random uh, uh, sort of articulation, how I was thinking about this. So I send out applications, because uh, I was an English major, right? So I send out applications to PhD programs, English PhD programs everywhere. I had no idea that they wouldn't even consider me because I didn't have a master's. I didn't have anything that really, you know, I had no idea. But at CUNY, somebody in the English department, for reasons that I won't be able to, to uh, uh, discover, um, uh, but certainly in some way connected to Stanley's work, establishing the MALS program and, and trying to establish a PhD program that I, I, my understanding is the MALS program kind of turned into. We couldn't get the cultural studies um, PhD program. Uh, somebody in the English program passed my application to the MALS program. And I got like a, a, a call from the MALS program saying, uh, we got your application from the English program. We think you should, you should check us out. So I came here, the Master of uh, Liberal Studies program. I was a, a, a concentration in American studies, which meant I, I was required to take two classes in American studies. And other than that, the rest of the building was accessible to me, the entire rest of the building. So my first semester, I wandered into Stuart Ewan's course oh. and like, for somebody coming out of Stratcom and looking for critical perspectives on Stratcom, I mean, what a stroke of luck. You know, we were learning his the PR book that he had just, uh, PR and the typecasting book he had just put together. Captains of Consciousness. Captains of Consciousness was earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, Stuart was 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 the perfect person to, to start out with. Um, two semesters later, I wandered into Stanley's class. Stanley that semester was teaching the sociology of everyday life. Um, I had no idea what the hell that meant. But it sounded really, really interesting. And I happened to be online registering for classes at exactly the right moment. So before that class filled up, I signed on as a MAL student and wandered into Stanley's class. So my introduction to Stanley and my introduction to Marx and my introduction to critical theory and, and, and critical philosophy, my introduction to everything that Stanley introduced me to came through Lefebvre. Fascinating, right? And Lefebvre's three volumes of the Critique of Everyday Life. I experienced very directly the handful of sentences I could understand because I didn't have the vocabulary yet, you know? But the handful of sentences I could understand were about where I grew up. They were my life. There was a critique of my everyday life. It wasn't everyday life in general. This was my everyday life. The way that Lefebvre talked about popular culture, the way that um, uh, Stanley and, and this group of like a relatively large class for Stanley, there were 20 or 30 people in it, all of whom knew so much more than I did. The way that they uh, talked about Lefebvre, talking about everyday life, um, they were talking about me, you know, which in a very interesting way made me feel alienated from the group, right? Like in a way I didn't belong there. Like if nobody else was, was feeling these critiques, hit them the way that I was feeling it, then like I'm alone in a certain way here, but I was alone in the best possible situation. I was learning exactly what I wanted to learn exactly what I was there to learn. Um, so the singularity of Stanley Aronowitz, for me, uh, first of all, is a non-charismatic 
theory of singularity, right? It's not about Stanley as an individual, it was the environment that he built around himself, right? Michael, you mentioned this as well as, as, as part of like, what is Stanley's, the experience of, of Stanley? Um, and in those classes, which he allowed me uh, to, to uh, uh, sit through, he became my, my, he was my master's advisor, you know, like in the first couple months I was in his class, I sat down, I, I went to his office and said, this is like who I am, this I don't know shit, and like I'd really like to learn. <laughs> and Stanley leaned back and laughed a little bit and said, hey, you got a lot of catching up to do. I said, yeah, I think I've got a lot of catching up to do. He said, all right, you'll catch up. And he gave me four years, you know, to, to catch up, advise my thesis. And then he let me sit in on classes later. I went to all the... Um, the Breck Forum, the Institute uh, reading groups. So because Stanley forged all of these different kinds of environments, right, this degree program, the, the, the environments that existed within his classrooms, the reading groups, um, I was able to connect to a body of thought and a body of practice and a way of relating two people and two ideas that I otherwise would have lacked and been searching for. And I don't know in, in the, the uh, too many years, 12 years or so since I uh, uh, met Stanley, it was 2010 or, no, no, I'm sorry, earlier than that, 2007. Um, uh, short circuit thinking about when I met Stanley. Um, uh, in the years since. Um, what I have discovered is that number one, the environments that Stanley created don't simply pre-exist in places that Stanley hasn't been and hasn't worked on and hasn't created environments. Um, so um, if uh, the question is the singularity of Stanley Aronowitz um, and how to think that through when we're thinking through the knowledge factory and the dismantling of the corporate university, um, for me, the experience of going to a place where we could think, take the time to think and read carefully and think about our lives and have ourselves critiqued and our own thinking critiqued. Um, and then the experience of leaving that and lacking it again, over and over again, like commuting from New Jersey, from the place I grew up, sitting in classes with Stanley and then getting on the bus or the train and going back, like really feeling the physical separation, the geography, missing the space. Um, and then detaching, you know, and I, I graduated from here, I went to Rutgers, where I'm still working on my, my media studies PhD and working, uh, uh, teaching three classes there and two classes at Montclair State, an hour away from each other, I have to be on both campuses, several days a week, all that. Um, what I discovered is, is, is um, uh, we have to create them, right, like the singularity of Stanley, like what I connected with, what Michael Menser and so many others of us connected with, being around Stanley, the ways that we were allowed to think, because Stanley thought the most important thing was to have the time to think, the time to enjoy thinking and enjoy critiquing. Um, that without Stanley around doing the work, without somebody around doing the work, it doesn't exist. AFT, I'm on two campuses where AFT controls the politics, American Federation of Teachers controls the politics. I was a, a, an elected vice president for my adjunct union and spent two years during COVID trying to, to turn our union's attention towards time and towards culture and towards education. And what I was told over and over again was that's not the strategy that comes from the state directors and the lawyers who work together to make sure we're in the best possible position for the next contract negotiation. So all the protests and everything is, is marketing for the next contract negotiation. And ultimately it comes from the lawyers. And if we do anything on the ground that the lawyers think might, might uh, threaten something, a public image or something three years in the future when the next contract is up, we can't do that. And of course, of course there's solid reasons for that, right? Like this is such an effective, um, uh, uh, the, the control of some unions, at least, over campuses are such an effective reproduction of the corporate university, exactly because they are all that's on campuses where, especially AFT controls, if you want to get into politics and think that there might be something to do. And then you get in, and this is a very well-built machine to discipline the voices within, uh, within the union itself. Um, so how do we uh, think about the singularity of Stanley? Um, and, and how to dismantle the corporate university while thinking through Stanley's singularity. We have to create those spaces, right? And when we're thinking about how to, to get undergrad students um, uh, enthusiastic and energized about reading more difficult work than they're used to, um, 
uh, what we absolutely need to do is make it less abstract, right? Like it has to be about their lives and it doesn't matter how difficult the text is, if you're reading it slowly and you're encouraging your students to connect it to their lives and you're helping them connect it to their lives, they'll connect with it, right? But it's the pedagogy, the access, the curriculum and the space, all of which is in the context of the time that it takes to do all of this, right? Stanley's, um, I'm gonna close more or less here. Um, one of the things that Stanley talked about I, I, the most towards the, in, during the years that I was um, around him anyway, um, uh, scarcity and the transformation of everyday life, right? Like um, that scarcity uh, is, is produced, um, scarcity is not uh, uh, necessary. Um, we don't have as scarce time as our students believe that they have, except that they really do. Right? Like if our students just individually said, you know what, I want to spend my time learning instead of seeking credentials, they'll be screwed in the job market, potentially, potentially, right? Like human resources folks and the, their advisors who say you're going to need, if you want a job over here, you're going to need these things. There's a reality to that. So when we tell students we want you to spend less time on the reality of your job pursuit that like you legitimately, for good reasons, rationally think you're going to need to do in order to keep a roof over your head and, and reproduce yourself, if all we say is, you should spend time learning instead, then yeah, they're not gonna, they're not gonna connect to that, right? But if we immediately make that that learning, we immediately make Lefebvre about their actual life, we make Lukacs about their life and encourage them to bring that into bring their lives into our learning spaces and bring our learning back out into their lives, then we've then we've got something. So um if the singularity of Aronowitz can be structural and not uh, attached only to the presence of Stanley, then it's gotta be about producing those spaces where we can learn that way. Um, and I hope we can all seek to do that. Thank you. David, can I, um, are we? Uh, yeah, we'll can I... just a few minutes. I think the wine is here. We have okay. to... <laughs> the wine, that's right. right. The, the security has already come yeah. to tell us, uh, you know, it's time to- So I think with students- Can I make one comment? Yes, please. Is that okay? I just yeah. wanted to say, Please, I mean, what David uh, mentioned about this thing in the New Yorker. Uh -huh. I just want to comment. One of the book, one of the things that's very interesting in Stanley's book, The Knowledge Factory to me, is canon formation, right? And this is something that, you know, we, we hardly touch upon. You know, there's an exceptional book for, um, that is now out, and he wrote one back uh, 25, 30 years ago by James Guillory. I don't know, some of you probably know. This, this book. He's a guy from New Orleans, uh, you know, who, who went to Yale and now is, uh, lives in Brooklyn, uh, retired professor. I forgot where, where he was before that. But it's very interesting on canon formation and how it shifted, you know, historically. This is uh, going back to what Yvonne was thinking about the, uh, the paradigm shifts, right, in a sense. So uh, I, I think this is very important to read alongside, you know, somewhat dialogically and dialectically with, with Stanley's work here too. And yeah, you know, even though I appreciate, you know, the fact of how universities the last 10 years, 15 years have been really hit. I mean, I, I've gone through this at LIU Brooklyn, similar to you. We used to have, you know, uh, 35 philosophy courses in a semester, we're down to three give you an idea about, you know, outright rapacious, you know, uh, administrations. Like Sonia speaking about, I think the model was really the LIU president that's going around the uh, the uh, world right now, you know, yeah. kind of denial of academic freedom. To me, this is part of the real the struggle too. And, uh, you know, again, I think that you, you, Michael, in some ways, you know, by building a cultural, you know, an educational wing to the union is so crucial. It is. This is Absolutely. what's really been lacking in food the BFC. There's nothing really there at the BFC. Yeah, what's that going? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I I want to say um, you're talking about students having you know becoming careerists and stuff, which is you know I mean they're under the pressure of this market and the you know competition. Uh, I do the same. My students, I'll, I'll say, you know, how many how many students are here just to study? So nobody raised their hand. They said, how many here get a career? I said, how many students? besides their career, want to learn things and study, and they'll all raise their hand. We've had uh, Rick Wolf, we've had Stanley, Michael, others, uh, Francis Fox Piven speak at our school. Our college at that time tried to stop Stanley from speaking <laughs> because he was a communist. <laughs> oh, like, end, end. <laughs> 
That was our union president who said it at the time. Anyway, um, but the striking thing about that is the students were enthralled with Rick Wolf, especially, but also with Stanley. I mean, you were there. I mean, we had one of the biggest turnouts. I mean, it was well, so there's a desire there. You know, there, there, it's there. And those students can kind of do both. You know, maybe that's our a little bit of our capitulation, you know, that they, they're going to need to follow their career, a career path. There's no way they're not going to, but it doesn't exclude them from really learning sort of critical thought and having that sort of critical dimension because they do eat it up when it's there. I, I just wanted to address maybe something. I, Josh, uh, um, uh, sorry, David, you were talking about uh, what we call pathways. Yeah. It's like a conveyor belt. We had and that. it's it's, a, it's like a feeder for colleges. And it's awful because the students don't make any choices over their curriculum. And it's a way to get them there and feed the, we make uh, alliances with the other schools to guarantee them so many students. And it's really, really yeah, awful. I think it's an appendage of that financial aid. So Chip that happened. During yeah. The so the issue I wanted to bring up and you kind of raised it, you know, this I think starts with Reagan. Uh, we can call it the Reagan revolution, you know. Uh, there's an attack against, you know, a student movement, especially at Berkeley, right? He's in California with Mies and everything. And I mean, they aggressively go after dismantling the education system and specifically by dramatically cutting funds. And I think uh, some of us mentioned it here, the dramatic cut in funding from mostly the state, right, is really big. And then what happens is, and, and the county, and then so our schools start to take on what? Oh, an entrepreneurial idea. Where are they going to get it from? Corporate America, right? So, I, but I think you can trace a lot of the things, a lot of the problems we have back to that. And 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 uh, so our colleges now do what? They talk about retention. Then they say, well, you got to look at the classroom. How come you're not retain, retaining the students, right? Uh, then you have uh, student affairs running your school. We have an academic vice president who's virtually, uh, you know, absent and silent on any sort of academic quality issues, right? So, you know, I, I think, and this raises, I think, the issue Yvonne is, was talking about everyday life. We are very dependent on the general cultural milieu. I mean, we, in Jersey, we have taxpayer revolts. So the, of course, anybody wanting to run for office is going to cater to them in the absolute worst way. So we've had this sort of reduction in the amount of credits a student needs to graduate. It keeps getting cut down. Then we have these pathways things. Now we have this thing called student success and anything that seems to smack of standards or making it difficult for a student to just glide through, we say it's a barrier to student success. So, you know, generally I think we, we need to be concerned with the general cultural atmosphere and attitude. I mean, if we have a general attitude where, you know, I'm so fucking tired of paying taxes, you gotta cut it. And, you know, let the state, you know, uh, uh, cut that money and uh, let the colleges start, start, you know, really making these places work like a business. That's where we are now. So, uh, you know, that, that general sort of cultural atmosphere. I mean, we have to address culture in our colleges, in the unions, but also, you know, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. We still have the police, unfortunately. So, yeah, well, they're not nice right up. Well, whatever, on a flexible battery. <laughs> so, I have a question for the, the union officials of Burns by Aronowitz. Um, have you guys thought about, uh, it, it, I don't know, Jenny McElhinney, uh, she was supposed to be at the graduate center. I never saw her call from the union stuff, but I don't know if she took a, uh, you know, a class from Aronowitz. But she does talk about, the organic relationship, the power that uh, uh, service workers, public sector, particularly teachers, have to have organic relationship um, with their students. And it's a, but it has to be mobile. It seems like one powerful way, and we've tried a little bit uh, at the PSC, but a lot of pushbacks on the bureaucracy, is to bust up collective bargaining, right? the scope of bargaining. That restricts you from the demands that you could make, um, uh, raising broader student free higher education. Now, I'm in full New York. I know some like hey. that. With <laughs> OCC, full totally it would be done. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and that would seem to be in line with the Ron with critique of collective bargaining in the narrow. Uh, ways and pushes with the, the class struggle. So it sounds like Hudson County seems to be bucking the trend upstairs. I'd like to see more of the detail. But um, 
had that been any uh, thought about that, or is that was your strategic position as an official that you would have to raise that or when you were there? And Robert scored this upcoming strike. Uh, they're going to win. Uh, I think that's going to have to be. And I heard one of your friends, Wilson, saying, Well, we're not going to be able to address the issues. We're probably going to go strike. We won't be able to address the issues. What kind of struggle are you going to raise? You got to bring in the broader working class. And how can you use collective bargaining to do that? Uh, if I, I'll start, I guess. The, um, uh, you raise a question uh, that is near and dear to my heart. Um, so Todd Wolfson, uh, ex-president of uh, the AFT full-time chapter at Rutgers, there's a full-time, uh, it's full-time faculty and TAs in the same chapter, and then there's the adjunct AFT uh, local. So uh, Todd was uh, president uh, before the current president. He's now vice president. The current president is named Becky Given, um, and she's uh, like a, a labor, like a contract. She, she teaches and researches contract labor, like um, collective bargaining and stuff. Um, Todd is also on my uh, dissertation committee. Sure. Yeah, he's he's on my dissertation committee, yeah. along with Deepa Kumar, who was the president of that uh, before uh, uh, of that uh, local before Todd. Um, yeah, the so um, both AFT locals uh, at Rutgers. In this is my opinion, and they all disagree with me, especially the people on my committee, very uh, uh, strenuously. Um, uh, have. Um, really committed to the idea, I think, of marketing as a labor movement while acting as a contract negotiating yeah. unit. Um, so like the closer to, this happened four years ago uh, as well, four years ago, uh, everybody threatened to go on strike before, during our contract negotiations at Rutgers. Um, everybody was ready for it. We took the pictures with signs and everything to let the administration know. The administration gave a little bit uh, to the full-time faculty unit and the full-time faculty unit went away. And then it was just a handful of adjuncts holding signs by ourselves. No, and, no. Uh, and that was it. So um, we actually got, the adjuncts got a really good contract out of that, uh, weirdly compared to other adjuncts. Um, but uh, they have brought in Jane McAlevey uh, and, and sent everybody involved in the union to uh, Jane McAlevey's quote unquote strike school uh, over the course of the last year or so, um, because one of the mistakes I think that they've made is, is they all uh, decided that there was going to be a strike around these contract negotiations three years ago before. And I, I don't think the environment is exactly what they think it is. Um, but Jane McAlevey, uh, her book's OK. The strike school, other people in the room may have been to it as well. Um, I, I feel very strongly what Jane McAlevey is doing is applying basic 1950s direct sales techniques to uh, what she's calling union organizing, but it's just simple consumer research. That's it. So like she says really neat things about organic relationships between faculty and students and all that. But the recommendation, what she teaches at, at strike school um, is, is like uh, how to give sales pitches essentially to students and how to like um, do uh, audience research so you can anticipate how many people are going to vote for the strike before you send out the strike cards and stuff like that. And it's all about like condensing and elevator pitches and like it's, it's sales stuff, you know? Um, and I think that that more than anything else is what's trapping us in this cycle of, of reproducing every three or four years, the same contract struggle. It's a campaign, right? Like they want to use the contract to create as much stress as possible. So they get as many new members as possible because Janice, and also because AFT is an arm of the Democratic Party and they need free trained labor for the next election and strike school and everything else getting ready for the contract is training that future free labor for the next next election. And that's what it all aims to. And I, I think Jane McAlevey, uh, no idea how sincere or insincere or authentic or inauthentic or whatever, but the way that she's put together her programs and what AFT at Rutgers has signed on to is just a marketing, it's a marketing push that calls itself organizing. Thank you. 
Although I will say just to like in this, uh, like they're, they're hitting their goals for mobilizing and organizing right now. And they think that they're part of like the teacher's strike wave. This room has been great today. It's been so refreshing because like everybody at AFT at Rutgers thinks teachers are winning all over the place and we're part of a strike wave that's gonna win at Rutgers too. And I, I think uh, obviously, like I, I think it's just misguided and, and will be declared a win like no matter what happens, because that's what they do every contract cycle, no matter what they get, it's a win. Three years later, it's the evil administration treating us badly. And then no matter what they get, it's a win. And then, you know, we, we keep Maybe rolling on. For the second and last moment, I'll give you a little standing uh, comment on the AFP. Michael, Randy spent six hours in the class. <laughs> Matters like the local the local really matters. I mean, yeah. This story that Mike yeah, the local matters. So it's it, great. It, yeah. You know, I, this is an old union adage, but I think if your story really represents it. I mean, you don't get much for being friends with management. No, you, know, it, you have to have a union president that's willing to have a strong wall, and then with the support of the members, you can. You can also, you can also, and I, I, you know, this is something Stanley raised. Uh, you can also work with the minute once you establish your position as being independent and that, excuse the expression, that you'll fuck them if they, if they fuck with you. Once they know that and they know you'll do it, you can work on some mutual things with them, which we did. What, what, one of the things we, first things we did besides going after, aggressively going after hostile administrators and, we, and we've removed them from our school, HR director and the uh, Dean of uh, the Academic Affairs. Um, what, what, the first thing we did was we agreed with the administration to limit overload classes that our faculty taught. So traditionally at our school, the way the college worked it was they allowed faculty to teach as many overload as they wanted. Okay, so what does that mean? They're not gonna negotiate for, for a contract because some of these guys, their base pay was 60,000 a year. They were taking home like 160,000. They were, I mean, it was crazy shit, right? So uh, against a lot of my members who kind of saw this as a gravy train, now, what did they care about? All day they were teaching. And I mean, they had lots of scams going on. And I said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to limit overload to two courses a semester. Administration said, great, we love that. We said, great, we love it. Uh, except we'll only do it if those salaries move up. You want to bring down the overload? We'll do it. We're there with you. Let Salaries got to go up. And we kind of dangled that out in front of them. And it, and it really worked. And it got my members to think that they should be getting paid with a decent wage without having to teach a gazillion freaking classes. So I, I wonder, I'm uh, sorry, your first name? Jay. Jay? Jay. Jay, Jay. So uh, I just want to say, like, some of my best friends are lawyers, but um, we, we don't allow the lawyers to negotiate our contracts. A, a lot, most unions do, and it's a very big mistake, I think. And I, I, those, I think, who have the lawyers negotiate their contract, get a shittier deal than we get, you know? Because what the lawyer does is they'll come in, they'll say, uh, unions, uh, the college is never gonna go for that. And, you know, I shielded my members on that. I'm like, we're not even talking about that. We're gonna talk about what we think we should be getting here and how fucked up it is that we haven't. So we raise social justice issues, things that this guy Paul Johnson talks about in uh, uh, Success While Others Fail. It's a great book to read, but uh, you know. But uh, what I wanted to say is, there's a lot of things in New Jersey that you can't put in your contract by law. The administration, by law, has prerogative over a lot of things, but it doesn't mean you can't put pressure on them or really force their hand on those things in many other venues. 
Anyway, I could go on. Sorry. Speaking of forcing hands, thank you so much. Uh, the police are here. This was great. Uh, you know, two very beautiful personal testimonies, two very good interventions. Uh, thank you so much. And by the way, anybody wants He's a historian. I think museum. He has a background in museum science. Thank you so much.